So we begin right away, and I will introduce my colleague, Tamara Broderick, who will introduce the first session. So please come in. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm extremely excited to start off a series of what I'm sure are going to be uh, amazing talks uh, by introducing Professor Jun Liu. Uh, he's in the statistics department at Harvard University, and among many things, he's known for his work in um, Markov Chain Monte Carlo and statistical applications in biology. Uh, it is a great honor and also humbling experience to be a uh, uh, first speaker on this uh, important symposium and important event. Uh, as you will hear more about really big messy data later on, so I will start with the uh, age long or maybe millennia long question of uh, finding relationship or doing correlations. I think correlation, this Pearson correlation, <clears throat> really started uh, about a hundred, more than a hundred years ago. Uh, Steve uh, Stigler will probably give you a more precise account of the history. Uh, so I think it is a good time to revisit this topic, uh, especially in light of uh, the so-called big data things. And uh, one of the, uh, my imagination is big data en enable us to find some funky stuffs, including uh, nonlinear relationships, although it's a really tar uh, very hard journey. And especially when you talk about relationships, it's becoming a murky question. It's not a well-defined mathematical question. And uh, we all know all the uh, random numbers generated on computer are pseudo-random. They are all deterministic. So they are all sort of truly deterministic relationships. Uh, from this perspective, uh, this question is garbage. But from practical uh, point of view, everyone is trying to look for this and trying to do something. And, uh, as you can see that, uh, these are some of the images uh, we produced in, uh, in light of some of the recent papers. Uh, one of the most noticeable paper is, uh, uh, is published in Science a few years ago by our Harvard and, uh, and MIT colleagues. So one of the prominent uh, authors is someone famous across the road, uh, Eric Lander, and also some uh, CS professors in Harvard. Uh, the, no, so I, I really arouse some hate-love uh, relationships or hate-love sort of sentiments uh, regarding this publication, no matter whether you like it or not. It does get a lot of uh, uh, notice and make us interested in the problem again, including myself and my group. So these are some of the uh, simulated data. You can imagine uh, adding more noise to that, so every, every picture will become complete random noise if you add enough noise. Uh, but if you add very little noise, you can see very clearly the relationship. The question is uh, how we can find the relationship like this. Uh, so, or whether we can find some kind of uh, concept like correlations to uh, reflect this. So this is uh, old stuff. The first one is Pearson correlation, Pearson sort of in Nin, uh, 1900, around that time, he was very active, the most prominent uh, statistician. And this is I I his name. I'm not exactly sure whether he invented this or not. But linear regression was earlier than that. Essentially, this is equivalent to linear regression. Uh, so if you square this, it's the famous R square. Uh, so there are some related ones, like run uh, correlations and so on. And and there's another noticeable advances in recent years. It's called the distance correlation. It's a very fascinating concept and can deal with nonlinearities quite reasonably well. Uh, in short, it's really just correlation between the distances. So in other words, you turn original data pairs into distance pairs. Uh, uh, superficially, you increase the data from n to n square over 2 roughly pairs, and you do the correlations. And uh, there, they, he just told me that there's a new algorithm which can compute like n, n log n time instead of n square. So it's uh, faster than, that, than it's uh, apparent. And this is the maximum information coefficient uh, recently advocated by this uh, MIT Harvard group. And its idea is very fascinating, and also uh, the, the 
the goal is inspiring. Goal is trying to find relationship as arbitrary as I just showed you, and also trying to be so-called equitable, meaning that if you have a coefficient of 0.5 for this particular relationship or that particular relationship or linear relationship, they all roughly mean the same thing. Well, even for linear, we don't know exactly what that means, the linear coefficient 0.5, but we sort of pretend we actually have some sense of what that means. Uh, but they, they want this type of uh, generalizable things. Uh, I will try to give you some plots, some our initial thoughts on what this means, but I think this is still open to the air, so trying to invite people to contribute on exactly what they mean to be equitable. Uh, so the idea of MIC is I just borrowed their plots, is suppose there's relationship like that, you just discretize the areas, it's especially two dimensions, so it's low dimensional problem, not high dimension. And you find the discretization so that you can maximum mutual information of this axis and this axis. And ideally, you probably would think about this two-dimensional dynamic programming, which is not computable uh, in, uh, in polynomial time. One-dimensional dynamic program is doable. So in practice, what they did is discretize one, uh, one axis uh, into fixed, uh, fixed intervals and then using some dynamic programming to optimally choose the uh, discretization of the other dimension. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, their ideas. We, incidentally, we came up with a similar idea for slightly different problems, and eventually they actually became the same problem. So I will tell you the story about this uh, journey. And so, of course, uh, you will optimize this, and the computation is pretty hard. There are some arbitrariness of what is pre prefix level of resolution, so how you really do that. There are some new advances in recent uh, years from the same group uh, of MIT trying to uh, perfect, uh, make this August, make this measure more perfect and make computation more reasonable, which we haven't followed closely yet. Okay, let's start with the simple case where everyone's supposed to know uh, if two random variables are discrete, uh, we can do simple chi-square test. Uh, so one of the first thought uh, in all this problem is trying to say, okay, we discretize them, then do the chi-square. The chi-square is also approximating likelihood ratio test, also is the uh, mutual information. So they are all sort of uh, equivalent uh, in general. So if so, we start with a slightly less simpler case, that is one is discrete, another is continuous. This actually become quite interesting. It's not a, as sort of naive as uh, one discrete, one continuous. This really is a, 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 a generally corresponding to the k-sample test. Like two-sample test is really testing the independence between the labeling and the value. So that's sort of discrete value of whether it's from sample one or sample two, and actual continuous values with what number you took. So that's equivalent. So, and in fact, any k-sample test, testing whether k-sample have the same mean or same distributions, is equivalent to testing the independence of uh, one discrete variable and one continuous variable. Uh, so obvious idea is to say here we already have one discrete, so we can discretize the other variable, then we are done, we, are, we can do the uh, chi-square test. So that's roughly the idea, and actually there was an early paper by David Sigmund, they are just doing discretization by one cut, cut the continuous variables, at one place, so you make it binary, then you do a, a t, uh, the chi-square test, uh, then you can talk about what is the optimal ways to cut it. So this is a famous uh, two-sample test, that is you have a famous uh, uh, methods like rank sum test, uh, KS test, and so on. And what we can do is to think about sort of more formal models if we discretize that. And in fact, once you plug in some kind of models, a lot of these heuristic ideas uh, follow through. Uh, so if you are Bayesian, so it's more automatic, like me, it's more automatic to impose models on that, although they look silly, uh, but they're honest. So in some sense, uh, in, in a lot of sort of uh, scientific publications, people give you a so-called smart ideas, which appear to be smart. Uh, but if you actually write down the model, it's a pretty silly model and give you the same algorithm. 
And you would think it's silly if you tell people the model, but if you don't tell people, they think you are great, you are smart. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so this is uh, essentially the case. Uh, so if we, if we give the model, that's just really we are discretizing Y and conditional on the discretization, we'll assume X follows some binomial distribution, Bernoulli distribution. It's quite, kind of a trivial model. And if you do this, it actually automatically lead to computing the, this like to ratio test. Whoops. Uh, this like to ratio test give you the uh, uh, it's just the, the, the euro counts or mutual information. The additional term we get here, uh, if you are being Bayesian, this is uh, quite uh, automatic. That is really the prior number of discretizations on Y. And if you're not Bayesian or you're uh, subscribing to recent, uh, this, the recent, this kind of popularity of like lasso, those type of things, this is just penalization term, regularization uh, things. You're regularizing how many slicing you want to have. And then you have these uh, uh, measures, uh, which is essentially mutual information subject to some uh, penalizations. And this is a, a test uh, you can compute quite efficiently using dynamic programming, uh, although it's maximizing over all possible cut. And because cut is in one dimension, uh, in, in one of the variables, so you can optimize this using dynamic programming the same way as in this MIC paper, except this is we, we, we have discretized variable automatically. And the only difference is we have a penalization term, which make it a slightly not as ideal as their approach because they give you a number between zero and one. But if you like this quantity, you make a exponential to it, you get a number between zero and one, exponential to minus this quantity. So it's not impossible to make it between zero and one, uh, whether it's meaningful. It turns out lately we found it's actually a meaningful exercise to do that with a small twist. Uh, so there are some nice properties saying this is converging to mutual information if they're truly related. And this is, will have high probability equal to, one, to zero, exactly equal to zero if they're independent. Uh, because of penalization, you, you, when you have enough data, if they're independent, you will not cut. If you don't cut, this quantity is automatically zero. So, so then it's, uh, it's nice to have uh, these zero quantities so we can prove some of the things. Uh, so I will not uh, go into any details of series, but just show you some empirical comparisons. Uh, this is a T1, uh, that, is, that is the uh, Cauchy distribution with with different means. As you can imagine that the, the, the T test won't be useful because Cauchy has no means. Uh, so, but the rank actually will be useful. If you look at different test statistics for this problem, this is our dynamic slicing ideas. It's actually the most powerful in this example. The KS is pretty good. And distance correlations and MICs are here. Uh, this MIC somewhat is not good because of the way, I think their way of normalizing that, uh, diminishing the power of their test. It's not that their dynamic programming has any problem, just the way they, they uh, normalize them seems to be wrong. And this is another example which we simulated the, uh, with the same, same mean, they all have the mean zero, and one is unimodal, another is uh, this uh, bimodal, it's sort of the uh, only difference in, uh, in kurtosis. The mean and the variances are the same. So again, the t-test t, t uh, is not quite useful, and also this uh, uh, rank test is not quite useful. Uh, you can see the distance correlation still can pick up some power, and ks test is here, and uh, dynamic programming, and also this is equal partition is really you don't, don't do dynamic, you just partition with fixed, uh, fixed uh, levels, the fixed lens. It's actually performing very well in this case. Uh, I guess partly it's uh, artificial because the distribution are very symmetric, very regular. So if you do the, uh, the and also it turns out this uh, MIC is doing well, so in this case, uh, which it seems they are affected by some art artificial factors. This is another example where uh, the two distribution have different mean and different variances, and the T has some, uh, 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 some effect. So 
Uh, we also did this a uh, real example. I won't uh, talk too much about it's a uh, gene expression ones, and as I think uh, Rob they did some for uh, for this problem. But anyway, and uh, as typical, you can Bayesianize it. You replace maximization by summations. You get the Bayesian test. Uh, it turns out Bayesian test slightly more powerful than the maximization. It's uh, especially useful when you are doing so-called conditional tests, when you have too many categories to think about. The previous uh, things, if you're testing, say, uh, with only two categories, maximization has almost no difference with, um, uh, with this Bayesian version. But if you are dealing with many, many co uh, possible categories, that's becoming uh, more challenging. OK, so this is the. Okay, now we move on to this uh, more difficult case when both are continuous. When both are continuous, of course, you can also do the approach like in the MIC paper, you discretize both ways. And we did try that. And we also can do penalizations. But I always thought it's a little bit uh, cumbersome. So we are, we are thinking about something slightly smarter than that. And uh, uh, due to our other paper, which I will briefly mention at the end, we came up with uh, test statistics. Of course, if I only tell you this, you think I'm very smart. If I tell you the model, you think I'm pretty silly. Uh, so this is the test statistic we derive. We call it a theory for some other reasons. Uh, that is, you, if you slice, so you can slice, you can slice one variable, like for example, slicing y. And, and then doing some this contrast, trying to see the residual variance uh, differences. Oops, this is going away. So you can see that this is calculating the receipt, some kind of residual variances within each slice for the axis. So you cut the Y, you look at each slice. So I will show you a picture. So you are cutting the Y, you are looking at uh, residual variances. For example, you can s just simply calculate some sum of xi minus x bar square within each one. Uh, you can see, although there's correlations is zero, but these differences are quite drastically different for if each slice. So that means the slicing of Y affecting some distribution of the X. So you can detect that by looking at the differences of that. So the, the, the contrasting we are taking is, one is sort of, sort of weighted average of the log of these variances, another is total sum of xi minus x bar square, with unslicing ones. And uh, so now the question, so here again, we are trying to penalize them, and the term comes from some asymptotic analysis, like this lambda zero times log n seems to be the right order of uh, penalization. And the question then is, uh, the, we have been using ver version one for a while, that is just calculating raw sum of squares. Then the other day it just suddenly hit us saying, well, if we are trying to calculate correlations, some kind of generalization of correlations, why don't we just do a regression of x on y in each slice, okay? That means if you are linear, you actually capture the correlation in each slice. And even when you have one slice, you re retreat back to the original correlations. And indeed, if you do this, and uh, if you work through the simple algebra of these calculations, if the slice is one, this is just the regression uh, residuals, and this is the raw, raw, raw sum of variance, the ratio of this is exactly the R square in the standard linear regression. And if you exponentiate it back, that is this quantity, we call it the dynamic slicing R square. So this is exactly R square if you have only one slice. There's no approximations, no asymptotic, it's just exact. Uh, of course, if you have slicing, this will be slightly larger than R square because this tend to optimize this function. This, the, if you let s equals to one, this is r squared. So this is always slightly larger than r squared. The question is, how do we penalize this enough to make it not too much worse? And it turns out to be, so for this case, even there's no relationship between x, y, and x in this slice, you can still capture the variation changes. So in that sense, it's still giving you some power. Uh, so it's a very simple property of uh, the way we define them, of obviously, it's between zero and one. Uh, 
And uh, as I said, it's, it's exactly equal to R square uh, if it's one slice. And it does detect non-linear uh, non relationship. And so the, the interesting thing is, as long as these four conditional expectations and variances are now constant, you can, in theory, asymptotically detect them. And of course, it doesn't mean they're independent. Although we haven't come up with any real examples where all these four are constant, and, uh, but it's non-dependent. -de I think you could, maybe you can make up some sort of very symmetric ones. Uh, but nevertheless, so that's sort of the limit, somewhat the limitation. You can't claim happily saying, if this is zero, then, uh, then there's no dependence and so on. But this is R square, it's never zero anyway, right? The empirical R square will never be zero. Uh, so the power, uh, we just compare some, uh, but I will uh, show you some more, I will come back to this power a little later. Um, so the question is whether it is equitable, so to speak. Meaning that for different relationship, would this sort of measure of R square give you somewhat similar meaning? So if say R square 0 0.7, does it mean the same for linear or quadratic or other relationships? So the first plot uh, has a line in it. Uh, so because in this data, we always do some normalization. So there's some uh, non-theoretical uh, thing. The line actually comes from linear R square. So if we do the linear fit, the linear R square. This is the linear relationship. Uh, so this is uh, this, this axis, x axis is the increasing of the variance or standard deviation, okay? So as you have more and more variance adding to the relationship, you expect the rel this sort of R square is getting lower and lower. And this is indeed tracking the linear ones as we had explained. It is sort of falling back to R square. And then slightly over the, the, the linear as we uh, expected because this is sort of maximization over all possible slicings. And, uh, but it's not much. And especially when the relationship is weak, you don't really get too much over, over uh, shooting. And now it's becoming interesting that all this, we, we make a, this uh, y-axis exactly between zero and one. So you can see all these slopes for this relationship and for this relationship, they are all pretty much the same slope. So in some sense, for this kind of smooth relationship, this measure is uh, somewhat equitable. And this can, can indeed detect all this relationship. If you do linear regression, you can detect this relationship. This, this you can, this, this one you can, you can have some linear relationship. And this quadratic, and also this is another curve, and this is a sign. Uh, and of course, uh, the circle one seems to be falling apart a little bit, but still, you get some power. It's just even has very, when you very, have very low, low noise, you still can capture all of them, because you can obviously see if you slice them, there's uh, no relationship between x, y, but there's a, the changes of variances that can be detected by, by this, our generalization of the R score. Or maybe not. So here is another plot where we, we simulate the sign relationship, but we just let the, uh, the oscillation becoming larger and larger. You can see this measure is decaying. Even when I add the same noise, uh, the measure is decaying as you have more and more oscillation. Uh, so this makes sense, of, of course. and. Uh, I have a postdoc who gave me some nice uh, geometric interpretation of this. It's like if your true relationship is like a curve, your noise is like little ball sliding along the curve. If it's, if it's smooth enough, your curve doesn't overlap too much, you will have more volume. But if it's, it's oscillating a lot, your balls are always squeezing, then you sort of have very low overall volume. So that seems to be an indication of how easier detectable that is. Uh, but we still couldn't find a mathematical formula to compute this type of intuitions. But nevertheless, uh, I think this question is not exactly well defined, although it's very inspiring, uh, intriguing to think about the, the, the question of this equitability things. Okay, now I'm going back to talk a little bit about the power. So as you can see that, uh, so this, this one is our method with uh, penalization term equals to 2.0. And uh, 2.0, 3.0 is roughly equivalent to the BIC criterion. And if it's smaller than two, we also tried 0.5. This tends to be 
allowing too many slicing, and uh, this tends to be lose some powers. Uh, that does work much better for the high oscillation case, but in the smooth case, it, it, it allows some powers. Uh, but you can see that in these cases, uh, the power of this uh, dynamic uh, slicing R square seems to be higher than other competitive methods. And MIC has always been the worst performers among all this. It's uh, con quite consistently the worst performer among many tests. Uh, no matter, well, only in one out of like 20 cases it's actually performing the best. I, I'm not quite sure whether it's our implementation issues or there's some other issues, but it does lose power from its uh, science version of, of MIC. They may have a better version now. Uh, so, and also this, uh, uh, so for this relationship, actually linear things can do better because it seems to have a strong trend here. Uh, so we, we tested quite a few, like this is a linear case. Uh, we can see this uh, uh, dynamic slicing R square is, is somewhat in the, in the middle, slightly worse than the linear and the distance correlation and correlation test. But for quadratic, another more complex relationship, it's, uh, it's better. So like this is high oscillation case uh, with penalization term small will give you a little higher power. And also MIC seems to be working quite well here. And for the linear case, it's interesting. For the linear, we are picking up, and they're much better than the, uh, sorry, for the, for, the, for the circle case, we're picking up some signals much better than the linear method and distance correlation. It seems uh, in our experience, although this distance correlation can capture some nonlinear uh, relationship, but somewhat they perform the best for more like a monotone or reasonably smoothly uh, uh, linear case. So, uh, so this is the uh, this is another case where uh, we we have this M shape and uh, we can pick up quite well in this case as expected. It's sort of piecewise linear. You can you can do the we can do the best. Uh, so anyway, so uh, the same concept of equitability if you compare to MIC for different relationships. Uh, you can see that's more stable, although we don't really know what's the good measure of this, but it, it seems to be more stable than MIC uh, for, for the equitability uh, in this case. Okay, so now I change gear a little bit to uh, talk about, uh, uh, so extending this type of ideas into uh, higher dimensional data when you are trying to detect nonlinear uh, models. So this was recently published, and uh, we had some extension to make this more robust, but I would like to talk about the, the idea first. So if you have some kind of relationship in high dimensional case, in this case we are thinking about you have 1,000 uh, potential predictors, and the true relationship is y equals to x1 times x2. And of course, uh, this is uh, artificial examples. Uh, you can, so it's deliberately make it hard. If you do a linear regression screening, you can't find anything. It's a linear regression is having zero coefficients for if you just put x, y. And if you search through all possible interaction models, at least there are half a million terms you have to uh, think about. Uh, that's a little tricky and, and how to do that. Uh, but if you do the slicing ideas, uh, inverse uh, ideas, you can detect relationship by just looking at the this second moment changes as you are slicing y, so you can actually get uh, the variable x1 by linear orders. You just search through linearly, uh, linear in terms of number of uh, predictors. And once you have linear predictors as we, you, uh, we do in the typical uh, stepwise regression, we can stepwise add more variables. In this case, stepwise regression is quite interesting uh, you can you can think about putting another consider another variable say x two, and of course you when you are adding variables you will have many more to consider. But one simple test you can think about uh, is to do the regression of x two on the existing variables you have selected, and see whether that regression will be changed as you are changing slice of y. So here is a illustration. So for example, this is a 
overall regression of x2 and x1, there's uh, nothing. Uh, but if you slice in the y and look at corresponding uh, axes, corresponding to high values of y, these are in this corner, you can see the regression line is changing as you change different uh, uh, slices. So this can give you a pretty strong uh, indication that is a useful variable. So again, uh, if I give the model, it's sort of a silly. Uh, this is really derivable from this uh, conditional Gaussian model. That is within each slice, they have some Gaussian distribution uh, with, uh, with a mu and covariance matrix depending on the slice. And for those variables not related, we're assuming we are linearly dependent on axes with, uh, uh, with covariance matrix not depending on the slice. So in other words, this, this sort of additional useless variables only could depend on x but not on y. Uh, but this is actually very strong assumptions, especially for those useless variables. Uh, so this makes this algorithm very sensitive to some kind of outliers or slight uh, curved relationships, although it's kind of sensitive to detect uh, useful, useful variables, but they tend to give the too many false positive. So you can do the uh, likelihood ratio test, uh, which give you uh, this particular test statistic as we had shown earlier. That's the residual sum of scores from the regression. Anyway, so, so here are some simulations of uh, 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 of different type of uh, uh, relationships, and they show uh, pretty pretty good uh, good sensitivities, and especially for the kind of relationship like this. For the linear ones, you can see the lassos and the uh, SIS seems to perform better, but just uh, sort of slightly, we slightly lost in that case. Uh, in some sense, we're making use of the joint distribution of axes, uh, they're Gaussian. So, uh, but that seems to be both, uh, both plus and minuses, probably more minuses than pluses because we have to rely on this kind of uh, uh, relationship. Uh, one potential remedy though is to, uh, so these are some more simulation, I won't show you uh, results. Uh, so one potential remedy to deal with this so-called non-Gaussian or non-linear case uh, can be two directions, we, we are exploring both. One is to, so to, to think about some nonlinear fittings. So to previously, we rely on linear relationship on, on this uh, additional variables on the, the variables you have selected and trying to say whether it is sort of the linear regression will be changed uh, when you are doing slicing. But if you think about they may be, there may be nonlinear relationships, uh, it's possible to do some uh, nonlinear fitting, like using the kernel type of methods. So this is one approach. This approach become uh, quite complex, quite nasty uh, complex. And uh, so it's actually not hard to derive a test statistic, that which intuitively is obvious. That is, you do some nonlinear fittings within each slice. You can pair the residual sum of squares the same way as what you did before. But the question is, what is the null distribution of that? It's, it's becoming very tricky. And you may say permutation test. Permutation test then become tricky as well when you are conditioning on some variables. Uh, you can't really permute that, that way. Uh, so how do you do the permutation test in this non-parametric type of uh, questions? Uh, is a challenge. Uh, we have one of the most brilliant students uh, uh, at Harvard, uh, Xin Ren, he actually tackled this problem, find some nice way to do that. Uh, it's still in progress. Uh, another way which is more intuitive and uh, less uh, uh, weight lifting is to turn around to think about this as a logistic regression type of problem versus uh, sort of a discriminant analysis. Uh, because if you discretize y, so all these things, the linear regression type of things is somewhat equivalent to, uh, uh, to, uh, to quadratic linear discriminant analysis. And you can turn that into logistic regression, which is more like conditioning inference, conditional on the covariance. So this way we can alleviate dependence of this kind of Gaussian models on, the, uh, on, the, on the, all the other variables. Although we still need somewhat Gaussian relationship for useful variables. If it's useful, they have this uh, Gaussian unknown mean variance. But that is actually not too bad. So 
so if you go through this I, and do some also variable selections, uh, it turns out to be quite robust. So it can deal with some very uh, strange uh, sort of nonlinear relationships uh, you, you may assume on axis. And we have tested quite a number of simulations. It turns out uh, this one can uh, do, does not lose much sensitivity, but does uh, have a more robust uh, performance compared to the earlier linear regression approaches. So for example, in the case where you simulated some nonlinear relationship between other variables on this, this few variables, and if you're just using the linear regression relation, uh, approach we call theory, uh, you have much more false positives, but if you use this approach, it's, uh, the new approach is much better. Uh, Anyway, so, so this is another more complicated examples. So I will, due to time, I will quickly jump to the uh, acknowledgments. So these, these are a few published papers. And the, so this is really based on collaboration so with many students and uh, colleagues. Uh, there are a lot of uh, suggestions. And as, as uh, I started, this is really age-long uh, problem and it's uh, interesting to, uh, to think about that. So we can see many banks are getting our students, which is uh, somewhat a disappointment. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank Nonlinear regression, and then ask the question: uh, What's the loss of power for not knowing the model? Have you done studies like that? And like, you know, for example, if you're doing sine curves, you'd expect higher frequencies lead to more you know, greater losses and things like that. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good good suggestion. We've been thinking about whether directly doing some sort of nonlinear uh, regression type of problems. Uh, the only limitation of nonlinear regression is for this more irregular shaped uh, relationships. So this seems to be more universal as always. It could lose some power if you really have some smooth uh, relationships, I guess. Yes. Uh, so there is this notion of uh, popular for uh, uh, continuous standard variables. Uh, so I was just wondering if, you, if one uses popular method to actually uh, identify or detect an independence, how would that uh, perform with the model that you are uh, uh, I don't really know. So if you use popular method, what would happen? So I could, someone may, may be more knowledgeable in that. Sam? In your early talk, in your first part, you mentioned adaptability. What exactly is the intuition? You have an M-shaped curve, you have a circle, you have a sinusoidal curve. What exactly do you mean they're adaptable or similar to each other? So what is, well, in, in the smooth case, we can see that if you add the same noise, we sort of try to normalize and ignore some of the details. So for example, we know, it's a good, good question. We are still thinking about this. So how do you even define that thing? Uh, the, the initial effort we're making is we are normalizing axis, say between zero and one, and we're normalizing y so that the, the total variance of y is fixed. Then that's the original function. Then we try to add the noise uh, with, uh, with fixed variance. So we try the linear shape and the circle and all these things. And trying to see that if we add the same, same amount of noise to these shapes, whether our measurement will decay in the same way. So as I have shown in some of the pictures, they do decay the same way if the functional form is reasonable, so to speak. But yeah, you, you, are, you are poking on the, the soft spot. We are still thinking what exactly it is. I think my post on uh, Chen Lin's interpretation may be relevant, that how you quantify this ball moving along the curve. Maybe that's a definition of what type of curve we, we need. Yeah. Yeah. So can you describe a little bit more about the selection term in that state? What is that? Is that a selection of the or what is that? Start slicing uh, for the S Oh yeah, so and, and also how to do do with the multivariate if you slice it 
uh, we are not dealing with multivariate case. That's a great question. We are only slicing a univariate case. Uh, our dependent variable could be multivariate, you know, add in, but when we, you know, we are doing slicing, we are only slicing a uh, univariate y. And we are trying to find the uh, So our slicing is allowed to be arbitrary and along the sorted values of y. So you sort of y, then you cut them there. And we're optimizing over all possible slicing a test statistics, which is sort of the within, within slicing uh, sum of squares and overall sum of square differences. And, and for your test statistics, can you think it as those um, correlations and mirrors, um, which yeah. is, in this case, you are talking about independent test statistics. Yeah, in the continuum case, we are essentially using the sample correlations uh, within slicing sample correlations. Uh, for discrete case, well, in fact, it could be any measure, but just the computationally, it could be tricky, uh, depending on how it. The, the correlation uh, is like sum of squares and the sums are easy to, to compute using dynamic programming, which is efficient, but some other measures may not be. Thank you. Thanks everyone, uh, and let's uh, thank our speaker again.